None of the following lecture can be used without the express written permission of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. Hi, this is Professor Rick Ramos, and this is another lecture in the Criminal Procedures course. This is lecture number four, and it deals with the Miranda warning. Now, the Miranda warning, you hear this all the time on television, right? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to attorney and have them present during any question. If you wish, if you can't afford one, one will be appointed to you without any charge. Having these rights in mind, do you wish to speak to me now? Well, what's the history behind this? Where does it come from? Why do we have to give this warning? When we look at the structure of the Constitution, you have to remember the history was that the English would basically torture people, the colonists, to get them to confess to crimes of sedition, where they were rebellious against the king and the government. And so during the creation of the Bill of Rights, the Fifth Amendment was developed or created, and it basically said that you couldn't be forced to testify against yourself. You're protected from self-incrimination. Now, this is expanded over time, and we're going to get into some of the history of cases that are involved there. The other amendment we'll be talking about is the Sixth Amendment, which is right to legal representation, which becomes operative after a criminal prosecution has begun. So there's some forerunners to the Miranda case. Um, in 1943, there's a case called McNabb versus U.S. Now, the McNabb brothers were moonshiners, and they're in Tennessee, and they're making illegal whiskey. During a raid on their still, they kill a federal agent. The brothers are arrested during the raid, and they're locked in a strip cell naked for 14 hours. After that, they're interrogated for two days, and they finally confess to the crime. They get convicted, and they appeal to the Supreme Court and on their, because they basically said that they, this was illegal interrogation. And on appeal, the Supreme Court refused to address the legality of the confession, but instead reversed the decision on the case, citing Rule 5A of the Federal Rules of Criminal Prosecutions, which basically requires a prompt arraignment of suspects arrested for crimes. Now, arraignment means you're brought before a judge to, to determine whether or not you should be held responsible for the crime. But the next case was the one that really changed policing, and that occurred in 1960, and it was a Danny Escobedo case. So in Escobedo, he is arrested for the murder of his brother-in-law, and when the t police are put him in the patrol car, he has a, a comrade in arms, another crime partner, who's ratting him out. The police uh, basically say, hey, your crime partner's giving you up, and at that time, during the transportation to the police station, he says, I would like to have the advice of a lawyer. Now, in the meantime, his lawyer finds out he's under arrest and goes to the police station to see him. The attorney asks the patrol supervisor, where's my client? And the patrol supervisor says he's in an interview with the homicide detail and you can't talk to him till after the interview is concluded. So the attorney then goes to the on-duty chief of police and requests to see his client. And he's also told after the interrogation, you can talk to your client. He goes upstairs to the homicide detail. He's looking down a hallway. He sees a door open. He sees his client. They wave to each other. The client's waving him over, and a detective closes and locks the door. Escobedo asks one more time to see his attorney, but he's refused. And subsequently, he confesses to the murder. Subsequently, the confession was used in court to convict Escobedo, and his attorney had to take some action on this case. The attorney for Escobedo went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decision on the Escobedo case was that when the police are questioning a suspect, not just to gain general information, but with a focus on starting legal proceedings against the suspect, that the defendant has a right to representation in this case, and the Sixth and Fourteenth Amendment were violated in this specific case, the Sixth Amendment meaning the right to counsel, and the Fourteenth Amendment meaning the right to due process, meaning that there's a legal process, one of which being that you should have a, an attorney to advise you during your criminal prosecution. So now six years later, the Miranda case comes about. Now don't think that Miranda was some innocent character. Miranda was arrested for the kidnap and rape of a young lady and the victim positively identified him in a lineup. But Miranda was interrogated for two hours, and he signed a confession, and the confession was used to convict and sentence him to 20 to 30 years in prison. Now, his case was appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court basically said this. 
The prosecution cannot use statements, whether exculpatory or inculpatory. What that means is whether they show you're innocent or guilty, stemming from custodial interrogation of the defendant, unless it demonstrates the use of procedural standards to safeguard the privilege against self-incrimination. They basically said that in a custodial interrogation, the person, if the person is taken in custody or they're questioned uh, to gain information against their penal interest, they need to be told that they have the right to remain silent. Mr. Miranda was retried, excluding the confession evidence, and he was found guilty again and went back to prison. Ironically, he was killed in a stabbing in a bar fight, and the officers who investigated the case, they actually caught the suspect, and the suspect was read his rights per the Miranda warning from a card that Miranda had in his pocket at the time that he was killed. Now, not everybody has to give the Miranda warning. Private persons who make arrests don't have to give the Miranda warning. Only peace officers are bound by the requirements, and that's because they represent the executive branch of government. Peace officers must advise those in custody who are about to be interrogated of their rights per Miranda, that they have the right to an attorney and they have the right to remain silent. So what is custody? Well, if you say the magic words, you're under arrest, that's custody. Also, custody-like restraints have been interpreted as being a form of custody. Use of restraints or controls associated with arrest, including handcuffing, pointing guns at persons, putting them in a holding cell, putting them in the back of your police car. Ultimately, you establish if there is a formal arrest or re equivalent restraint. You can also turn the clock back. In other words, if you have somebody in the back of your police car and you decide that you want to interview them as a detainee, not as an arrestee, you could take them out of the patrol car and stand them up outside and, and talk to them at that point and get rid of that equivalent restraint issue that you're having to deal with there. So the issue is not one of focusing on the suspect. It's one of custody. If you have a suspect who comes to the police station and comes up to the front counter speaking you, to you through a glass window that has a hole in it, and you start to ask them questions in the form of interrogation questions, and they answer you, no Miranda is needed because they are really not in custody. They could simply turn around and walk away. Other examples where you don't need Miranda is if the person is talking to you on the telephone and you're able to get them to say some sort of statement that could be used against them later on in court, as long as you can verify who it is you're speaking to, you don't have a problem with that. Now, there is a situation where, let's say, you want to invite somebody to the station to talk to them, and you want to make sure that they know that they are not in custody. That's called the Behealer Admonishment. It comes out of a 1983 case against a suspect named Behealer. And basically, you want to make sure that they know that they're not in custody and they're free to leave. A Behealer Admonishment would go something like this. Thank you for coming down to the station to talk to us. We want you to know that you're not under arrest and you're free to leave at any time. We just want to talk to you about a matter. Do you mind answering a few questions? So again, examples of custody include the suspect surrounded by four officers with guns out in a helicopter overhead, or the suspect is secured in the back of a patrol car, handcuffed. Examples of no custody include a situation where you question a witness and it turns out that they are a suspect. As long as they are not told they're under arrest or restrained, you don't have to Mirandize them. Or the suspect agrees to meet you at the station and you question them out of custody. No Miranda again is needed as long as the suspect is free to leave and they know they don't have to cooperate. Other examples include no Miranda custody to question a suspect at the scene even though you had probable cause to arrest them upon first contact. You could be walking down the street, stop somebody, see blood on their shirt, and it's in a position they can't see it, start asking them questions about the crime, try to get some information that could be used on them later on. Even though you have PC to arrest them right then, you don't have to Mirandize them. If you're working undercover, statements from suspects are not subject to Miranda because they're not in custody. So the next topic is what's interrogation because I told you for it to equal Miranda you got to have custody plus interrogation. The person known to be a peace officer is in engaged in direct questioning about a crime. That's one example. The second is any words or actions likely to elicit an incriminating response. Again we have to remember Miranda includes the fifth and sixth amendment issues 
Fifth Amendment is, again, the privilege against self-incrimination applies to testimonial evidence only. So if you give me a statement, that information can't be repeated in court. However, I could use a statement to write a search warrant or go find other evidence against you. In State versus Anson, a warrant was issued for the arrest of the suspect. The police go to question the suspect out of custody. Police do not inform the suspect of the warrant. They question the suspect and his responses are used to convict him. Now, that's clearly a violation of Miranda because they've already started the proceeding against the suspect. And so that's something you want to make sure that you're mindful of. If you've started a criminal proceeding and there's a complaint against a suspect, you got to advise them of rights per Miranda. The other thing is, is if you don't know whether or not they have an attorney, you're really going to screw your case up because it's going to be a violation of Sixth Amendment or Fourteenth Amendment. In the case we just spoke about, the court basically said, although Miranda may not be required at the onset of all non-custodial police interrogations, it's logical to conclude that an accused must be aware of the right to counsel in order to decide whether or not to waive that right. At the onset of questioning, the accused must be advised that the adversarial process has begun and they can invoke the right to counsel if they wish, and this has to do with the case we just talked about. Remember, Miranda only deals with testimonial evidence, so there's other things that you could require of the suspect that would not be a violation of the Fifth Amendment. The privilege against self-incrimination is not violated in the following examples. You have the suspect model articles of clothing that were worn by the responsible of a crime. You have them participate in a lineup. You have them provide bodily fluids or other samples per a search warrant. You have them be fingerprinted. You have them provide handwriting exemplars. You have them repeat verbatim statements for voice identification. So basically, they would stand with a bunch of other people and they'd step forward, so this is a robbery, give me your money. Next person, this is a robbery, give me your money. You're just listening for voice inflection there. It's not a violation of the Fifth Amendment to require a suspect to provide routine booking information. And there's a case in Contra Costa where a suspect was brought in for shooting someone. They left him outside handcuffed to a rail and a lieutenant came outside and said, what are you doing here? Meaning, why are you here? You know, you should be inside. And he goes, I'm here because I killed my friend. And they were able to use that in court against the person. It's also not a violation of the Fifth Amendment for a suspect to answer routine questions on a traffic stop or to answer routine questions on a DUI stop where the suspect is yet to be arrested. Many citizens misinterpret Miranda thinking that anytime you make an arrest you have to read Miranda. It's not true. An example could be that you observe a suspect to shoot a victim. You arrest them at gunpoint. You've seen the whole incident. You don't need to question them. You've seen it. You're going to be the witness that's going to testify and put them in jail. You're not going to interrogate them, so no Miranda is required. If you do violate the right to remain silent, the suspect's statements can only be used in court to impeach his or her testimony. If they think they're going to jump on the stand and lie about what they said, you can come and rebut their testimony by getting on the stand, but that's in rare instances. But when you violate the Sixth Amendment, the case is most likely going to be dismissed, like in the Escobedo, Sixth and Fourteenth Amendment are violated. Uh, there's really a good chance the whole case will be thrown out. So how do we read the Miranda rights to the suspect? Well, as a young police officer, we were required to read the card. But the problem with the card was it was a really long statement and it was confusing. And you'd read the whole thing and you'd ask the person if they understood it or they want to speak to you. And they'd say, I don't understand it. I don't want to talk to you. So what I tell you to do is this. Listen, no one says you have to read the card. That's just departmental policy. Well, first of all, don't get in trouble with the department. But most departments have been changing how they are going about reading Miranda. And I say the new style is to sell it on the payment plan. Say the first statement, you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that? And let the person respond. This way you take it apart in each piece. You have the right to remain silent. And then you say, can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand that? You have the right to have an attorney present with you during any questioning or before any questioning takes place. Do you understand that? If you can't afford an attorney, one will be provided without cost. Do you understand that? Having these rights in mind, do you wish to speak to me now? And that's a better way to do it. Now, who wrote that original Miranda card? Well, I understand it was a DA that actually prosecuted Miranda. 
and I can't think of his name right now, but I'm sure you might be able to do that and find it and get it back to me in one of our discussion assignments. The old style was, do you understand these rights as I've explained them to you? And having these rights in mind, do you wish to speak to me? I really like the new style, and this comes from Devalis Rutledge. He says that you should ask the final couple of questions like, I know that you have a side to your story. Wouldn't you like me to hear it? Or, you know, it's important for me to hear your side of the story. Would you like to tell me what happened? Or do you want to talk about what happened? There's no legal requirement to do it like the old card. So it, all it says, the legal requirement is that you tell them they have the right to remain silent, they have the right to an attorney. That's it. And to make sure there's a procedure that covers that. Now, the next thing I need to talk about is waivers, because this is where we get in trouble again. You have two types of waivers. You have expressed waiver, and that's by what the person said. I would like to have my attorney present before any more questioning. That would be an express request to uphold their right to have an attorney. Or they say the opposite. Sure, I'd be willing to talk to you. What do you want to know? That's an express waiver. Implied where they want to remain silent would be done by remaining silent and not answering questions. Or implied waiver would be by starting to tell the officer what happened. They don't really say, yes, I'll do it. They just start telling you what happens, what's going to happen. So again, expressed is where they use the word to tell you yes or no, and implied is where they either just don't say anything or they just start gabbing away. For the waiver to be good, it must be knowingly given, it must be intelligently given, it must be voluntarily given. The officer can't use deception in order to induce the suspect to waive. In other words, you, if it's someone who only speaks Vietnamese, you can't give it to them in English, in English and they're saying yes, 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 yes. It's not going to work. You're going to lose that. If it's somebody who is an imbecile, they're not smart enough to understand what's going on. You know, Obviously, there's going to be some mental problems there or they're a person that's um, handicapped mentally. You may not be able to get an intelligent waiver. But once a suspect has waived their rights, officers can use deception to acquire statements. It can't be the type that would induce, would induce an innocent person to confess to any crime they didn't commit. I had a case where I had a robbery suspect, and although he wasn't an imbecile, he wasn't that smart, and he basically started to tell us a story. We knew it was a lie. We had some other information to show it was a lie. So... I took a big, big black marker and I wrote the word liar on a piece of paper and I put it on a copy machine. I told him it was a lie detector. And uh, every time he answered a question, he'd hit this button and he'd hit the button and come out liar. And he finally confessed to the crime and he complained in court and the judge basically said that he had waived Miranda so he, obviously he had done it or he wouldn't have responded the way he did. There are also such things as conditional waivers. We've, a waiver need not be absolute. If you honor the limitations, the rest is admissible. Examples include, John will talk about crime number two, but not crime number seven. Or, John will only discuss the crime verbally, but refuses to give a written statement without counsel. We had a case called the uh, Manny Gonzalez case in Berkeley, and the suspect had committed a assault with a deadly weapon. The suspect was Mirandized on tape. Uh, he says he understands and doesn't want to talk at that time. And the next morning he calls for the detectives to come in. The detectives read the, a new Miranda warning to him. The suspect waives his rights, but the officer neglected to read the part about the Sixth Amendment, basically saying you have a right to attorney. It was left out of that second tape recording. So the judge has to review both tape recordings, the first one and the second one. The judge basically holds, or the court holds, that the suspect understood his rights five hours earlier, and he's going to say the statement's admissible because he already said he understood his rights. Why would that change five hours later, except that he wanted to talk now? Another case is a Mitchell case. He steals a tractor. He basically invokes Miranda, but only the right to remain silent, but continues to talk to the police because he's concerned about his girlfriend. He speaks to yet again a second officer who again advised him Miranda, about the Miranda warning. And he says, oh yeah, I know Miranda. So he talks to the officers, he ends up confessing, and later moves to get his statement excluded. This case occurred in 1999. And because the defendant continued to have a conversation with the police and volunteered the information, it was found to be admissible. Other conditions 
would include you'd have a valid waiver if the officer focuses on other areas every, t every time the suspect says, I don't want to talk about that, or a valid selective waiver by the suspect saying he would answer some questions if he thought it was appropriate. The bottom line is if the person invokes their rights to remain silent by words of conduct which reflect an unwillingness to discuss a case, you got to cease the questioning. Exceptions. You may question about other cases and the subject can recontact you in case they want to talk to you. They change their mind. If they invoke the right to counsel and it must be clear and they must express a request for an attorney, it can't be something like, you know, that's ambiguous, like maybe I should talk to a lawyer. It's got to be a clear request. Then unlike revoking the right to remain silent, all contacts must cease, including questions about other cases. So here's a little quick test for you. This comes from Alvarez versus Gomez in 1999. The defendant stated he understood his rights. When asked if he would speak about a fatal shooting incident, his response was, can I get an attorney right now, man? Was there a violation of the defendant's rights? The defendant said, you can have one appointed to you. The defendant said, you can have an attorney right now? The detective said, yes. The defendant said, well then, like right now, you got one? I want to talk to one. Do we have a violation here? Was there a constitutional violation? Well, the answer is the three questions asked by the defendant amounted to an invocation of his rights to counsel and triggered an obligation on the part of the police officers to stop talking to him. Example of a violation was Stearns County versus Hannon in 2001. The defendant's arrested for murder and they bring him in for questioning and he says, I think we need an attorney at the beginning of questioning while in custody. The suspect says, again, I don't want to talk anymore. The defendant says, if you want to talk to an attorney, we'll have to stop talking to you and it will jeopardize your case. The defendant continues to talk and subsequent confession is excluded for violation of his Miranda rights. It's also really important if you can to get the waiver in writing. When you interview somebody, have them write a statement out or you write the statement for them and then have them check it. Any misspellings, any changes, have them correct it and have them initial it. It shows that they read the statement and they had knowledge of what it said. If you can, tape record the interrogation. If they invoke, remember they can still approach you. Approach you. Videotape is also good. Anything is good that you can retain that information on. Last thing I want to talk about is juveniles and Miranda. Treat them the same as adults except pursuant to WNI 625, they must be advised whether or not they will be questioned. However, it can be sometime during custody and certainly before questioning. It should be within about an hour from the time you take them in custody. Juveniles do not have the right to a parent during questioning. As a matter of fact, there's been some cases that have said that the parents will coerce the juvenile to give information to the police. Best practice is to leave them out of the interview room. The WNI code actually doesn't even say they have to understand it or they have to, they don't even have to answer you about it. It just says you have to advise them of the rights per Miranda. So that's the end of our lecture on Miranda. Remember, you only need it in matters of custody or custody-like restraints and only when you are going to question a suspect about a case. If they're not in custody, no Miranda is needed. This is the end of the lecture. Please make sure that you read the textbook and review your homework and exam schedules. Thank you very much.